Hi everyone, my name is Jack, and today we are going to review with you another horrific case. This high-profile story took place in January 2023 in the state of Pennsylvania, Limerick Township. The township, named after the first settler William Evans, is one of thousands of small and cozy towns scattered across the country. Here, a measured and quiet life flows, and it seems that nothing can disturb this harmony. In such places, the inhabitants know each other by sight, and their friendship makes many of them one family. Jennifer and Blair's friendship began while they were working together. They were once business partners, collaborating on common projects. However, even after Blair decided to become a simple chef, their bond did not lose its strength. Their friendship grew beyond business and became more than just a working relationship. Their friendship took on a special significance because of Jennifer's eight-year-old son, Noah, who has autism. Blair had always given his friend genuine support and helped her in caring for Noah. Their children were also friends. They often spent time together, and when the children's games would run late, Noah would stay overnight at the Watts house. Jennifer Brown, born in 1979, was an active and full of life woman. She was always smiling and exuded an energy that infected everyone around her. Friends and relatives often wondered how she managed to combine so many things and be active, but her true calling was motherhood. About the father of her son, Noah, nothing was known. But this situation did not overshadow their lives, but on the contrary, made Jennifer stronger, especially after Noah was diagnosed in early childhood with autism. Taking care of her young son, Jennifer became a reliable support and best friend for him. Mom and son were inseparable friends, spending a lot of time together, sharing moments of joy and supporting each other in times of need. This friendship between them evoked feelings of tenderness and admiration from all who knew their family. The people of the small town saw their closeness and adored this family for their cheerfulness and genuine kindness. Unfortunately, none of them could have anticipated what would happen to Jennifer one winter day. On January 3, 2023, she disappeared without a trace. On the morning of January 4, 2023, the local Limerick Township Police Department received a disturbing call from Antonio Blair Watts Richardson. He was deeply concerned about the disappearance of his close friend. Even though it had been less than 24 hours since he had last seen her or heard her voice, the anxiety inside him was growing by the minute. For hours now, Tony had tried unsuccessfully to contact Jennifer, but all his attempts had gone unanswered. This behavior was completely unlike her. She was active and responsible, always answering calls or messages, especially in matters concerning her son Noah. However, on this day, for some reason, the boy's mom did not meet him after school. The missing person's family and friends were well aware of what a devoted mother and caring woman she was. Therefore, the sudden disappearance caused serious alarm to all who knew her and left no one indifferent. Antonio's call to the police was the first step in a long and mysterious investigation that would soon engulf the entire city and shake it with its tragedy. Immediately after Blair reported his girlfriend missing, a massive search began. Police officers, family, and friends joined forces, hoping to find any trace that might shed light on Jennifer's disappearance. It left many questions in the air, and the main one was, what could have caused the caring mom to leave her son without any explanation? At four o'clock that afternoon, Officer Stephen Crawford of the Limerick Township Police Department went to the Brown family home to check on what was going on in the family home. He found that her vehicle was parked by the porch, and upon entering the home, he discovered that her keys, purse, tablet, and work cell phone were still in the house. However, the officer was unable to locate Jennifer's personal cell phone. Later, when police tried to track it down, it was discovered that the phone had been turned off at 7 a.m. on January 4th and could not be traced since then. The last location the signal came from was near Lewis Road and Ridge Pike in the town of Limerick. This was the first serious trace in the investigation and a sign that something terrible had happened to Jennifer. She was reported missing and police began investigating the case. Investigators began questioning her family, friends, and neighbors, hoping to find out if anyone had seen or heard anything at the time Jennifer disappeared. None of the young woman's loved ones or acquaintances, however, could provide any useful information. Her aunt, Diane Brem, and Jennifer's friends 
Tiffany Barron and Blair Watts, claimed that there was no way the young mother would have left alone, as she could not leave her son alone. This was a woman full of devotion and love for her child. All efforts made by the authorities and volunteers were fruitless. They could not find any traces or clues as to where Jennifer might have been. Her loved ones appealed to the public through the media for any information on the possible whereabouts of the young woman. A reward was set up, but that too was inconclusive. The case of Jennifer Brown's mysterious disappearance was just beginning to develop, leaving investigators and family with questions and anxious expectations. The police investigation began with a close look at all the circumstances of that day and her close friend Blair Watts, who was the last person to see Jennifer alive that day, came to the forefront. It was an ordinary January day. Jennifer and Blair sat in the cozy living room discussing life, future plans, and their children. Their children often played together, and Jennifer had asked her friend for help, to pick up her son Noah from school so they could spend the evening together. This was a common practice for friends. Blair, being the loyal friend that he was, agreed, and after finishing their conversation, immediately headed to the school to pick up Noah. The next day, however, something strange happened. At school, Noah behaved unusually and caused his teachers concern. They noticed that the boy had missed two doses of his medication that helped him manage his condition due to his illness. This was highly unusual as Jennifer had always been a devoted mother, never neglecting her son's caregiving responsibilities and always being in touch with teachers if anything happened at school. The school staff tried to find out where his mom was and was told by Noah that she had gone to the grocery store and had not returned. This caused even more concern as this behavior of a sensitive woman was very uncharacteristic. She never left her son alone. At this time, Jennifer's friend, Blair Watts, also tried unsuccessfully to contact her. After not hearing back or contacting Jennifer, Blair decided to see if she would show up to pick up her son from the bus stop. However, when the woman never showed up and concern grew by the minute, Blair had no choice but to go to the police and report his friend missing. As time passed, no new information about the possible whereabouts of the missing woman had emerged since the investigation began. Hopes for her return were fading with each passing day. It seemed that Jennifer had disappeared without a trace and might never be found. But on January 18th, two weeks after her disappearance was reported, two employees working in a warehouse near Roseford in the neighboring municipality of Limerick Township discovered something strange. They came out of the building to get coffee and saw what appeared to be a freshly dug hole in front of them. When they went closer to inspect it, they were horrified to find the body of a woman buried in a shallow grave. The workers immediately notified the police, who immediately arrived at the burial site. Upon examining the body, police identified the young woman they had been searching for the past two weeks as Jennifer Brown. The sheriff called her family and informed them that the missing woman's body had been found partially buried near a warehouse in Roseford. An autopsy revealed that Jennifer's death was clearly violent. Death was due to asphyxiation, and she had three broken ribs. This indicated that Jennifer had probably struggled with her killer, who had beaten her to subdue her. Now the nature of the investigation changed. The missing person case was reclassified as a murder case. Police once again began interviewing everyone who was close to the murdered woman, including her family and friends. However, these interviews yielded no new information about the case, and the police had no suspects. It seemed as if the investigation was about to wind down and the police had no one to follow up on. But later, when detectives least expected it, they got a lead from an unexpected source. After the news of Jennifer's disappearance and murder was published, the police called for anyone who had any information that could help unravel this mysterious story to come forward to investigators. Noah's teacher came to that call. She recalled a case that at first glance seemed unimportant to her, but after Jennifer's death was recognized, raised serious suspicions. The teacher said that Noah shared with her an important detail about that terrible day, January 4th, when Jennifer disappeared. Little Noah told her that when Blair Watts picked him up from the bus stop on January 3rd, the boy noticed that among Blair's belongings was his mom's personal cell phone. Noah recognized it immediately, 
as the lock screen displayed his own childhood photo. That moment turned out to be key in the investigation into the young woman's murder. Previously, investigators had already assumed that Jennifer's killer carried away her cell phone. Now Blair Watts came into the spotlight, becoming the main suspect. The police began to scrutinize the relationship between Jennifer and Blair, and mysterious details began to come out, shocking even experienced investigators. Jennifer and Tony's friendship seemed solid and long-standing. They spent a lot of time together, knew each other well, and their families interacted with each other. But once the business side of their relationship came to light, it turned out there was a dark history lurking beneath the mask of friendship. Blair Watts was the owner of a restaurant called Birdie's Kitchen, which unfortunately fell into disrepair and closed in early 2022. After this, Blair turned to his friend, asking her for help. In August 2022, Jennifer decided to invest in her friend's business to help him revive Birdie's Kitchen in a new location. They entered into a contract that stipulated that Jennifer would provide regular financial contributions to keep the restaurant going every six weeks or so in order to rebuild Birdie's Kitchen and get it back on the market. According to Blair, from August through January, Jennifer turned over approximately $36,000 to him to rebuild the business. They also agreed that she would hand him another $9,000, according to their agreement. Blair found a new location for the restaurant and was to deposit some of the money as rent, enter into a contract, and reopen Birdie's Kitchen in January 2023. However, it turned out that the money provided for the investment was spent on Blair's personal needs. The property owners with whom he had entered into the agreement drew attention to his failure to fulfill his financial obligations. Therefore, on December 26, 2022, they terminated the agreement with him. Blair found himself in a desperate situation. He lost not only his money, but also the opportunity to open his restaurant. The police began to suspect that in desperation he had decided to commit a terrible crime to save his business. Looking closely at the financial transaction history on Jennifer's iPad, investigators discovered two unauthorized transfers of $17,000 to Birdie's Kitchen on January 3rd. The funds were not included in the formal agreement between Brown and Blair. In addition, the transfers failed several times and were only successful after the two-factor authentication system on the iPad was disabled, which increasingly pointed to Jennifer's friend's involvement in her murder. Police then interviewed the owners of the property, who had terminated their lease with Blair. It turned out that on January 4th, the very day Blair reported Jennifer missing, he appeared before them, saying he had the funds to enter into a lease agreement. Investigators were convinced that Blair was the killer. However, realizing that he would never admit his guilt, they needed to gather irrefutable evidence. Their first step was to interview Blair's wife, Tiara Taylor, and find out where Blair was the day Jennifer disappeared. Tiara told detectives that on January 3rd, Blair visited the Brown family around 1 p.m. and did not return home until 4.30 a.m., when he picked up Noah from the bus stop. Tierra also claimed that her husband came home only briefly and then left again around 5 p.m. and did not return until late that night. This time, frame became a key point. Further investigation revealed that Blair had spent the night with Tatiana Garrett, his mistress, and did not meet up with her until around 8 p.m. This meant that between 5 and 8 p.m., Blair had no alibi. Based on the available evidence, Detectives put together an alleged chronology of the murder. According to their version, on January 3rd, Blair went to Jennifer's house while Noah was at school at about 1 p.m. and allegedly killed her. He then made two transfers of funds from the murdered woman's iPad to his account and left to pick up Noah from the bus stop around 4 p.m. Later, he returned to Jennifer's house, dropped Noah off, and traveled back to the crime scene to dispose of the body. He took the body to a field near Roseford and buried it in a shallow grave. From there, the killer made his way to Tatiana's house, where he spent the rest of the night. Everything was carefully planned, and it would seem that the murderer might have gone unnoticed had it not been for one mistake he made, and it proved fatal. That mistake was letting Noah see his mother's cell phone. That was the key moment that led the police directly to Blair. Law enforcement now had enough evidence to convict Blair, but they decided to investigate further to see if he was guilty. 
It took the involvement of film experts and a specially trained dog capable of detecting cadaveric odors indoors. First, the dog was brought to Jennifer's home so that it could memorize the woman's scent. There, in her own kitchen, the terrible crime had taken place. The police then directed the dog to Blair's car, and it instantly detected the same depressing odor. It was the last piece of evidence needed to bolster detectives' confidence in Blair's involvement in the murder. On February 8th, after months of investigation, Blair was arrested and charged with first-degree murder, third-degree murder, and theft. He is currently incarcerated at the Montgomery County Correctional Facility with no bail application and awaiting a preliminary hearing where he will have to answer for his horrific acts before the law. Jennifer's friends and family were on the brink of despair when they discovered her dead, but their hearts are still pierced by the pain and shock that the killer was someone they knew and trusted, someone who should have been a close friend to Jennifer and her son. But now that the killer has been identified and brought to justice, they can finally feel that justice has been served. Tiffany Barron, a friend of Jennifer's who spoke on behalf of the family, expressed her feelings during the interview. I still dream about Jennifer. Noah keeps asking about my mom, and I don't know what to say. At the conclusion of the investigation and trial, if Blair is found guilty, he will spend the rest of his life in custody. The case was solved thanks to the attentiveness of Jennifer's eight-year-old son. The boy noticed a mistake made by the killer. This helped to discover the truth and punish the criminal. The tragedy in Limerick Township serves as another reminder that even the most carefully planned crimes will sooner or later be solved. Meanness and inhumanity will not go unpunished, and the perpetrators will sooner or later be brought to justice before the law. Thanks for watching, guys. That was Jack. Subscribe to the channel. There are many shocking stories ahead. We'll see you again.